Okay. So, just to raise some awareness about the condition, really. Um, it's, it's an eye condition. It's essentially an involuntary eye movement condition. So, um, if you were to speak to me, it depends on whether I'm kind of tired or I'm maybe nervous or, you know, um, not focusing in the right way, um, my eyes will move. And that's what people with the their eyes, it's an involuntary eye movement, okay? Um, and this can be in any direction, and this is why it's been quite complicated to try and research it, because, as I'll show you in a minute, there's 47 types of nystagmus being recorded in literature. So it's quite hard to sort of narrow down a sample um, of people. Um, so I think my research is potentially going to be quite broad, at looking at the condition quite broadly. Um, so people's eyes can move in any direction or combination. So this could be, you know, their eyes move side to side, um, up and down, around. So it's involuntary as well. So the people don't see that it's, don't, don't realise it's happening quite a lot of time. Um, as I said, 47 types have been reported in literature. Um, a question people often ask is, do, does the individual with nystagmus see the image move in front of them? And with, if you had nystagmus from, from birth, what was called congenital nystagmus, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute, it's a bit, of, it's a bit contentious, that title, that, that name, but anyway, if you're sort of born with it, you, your eyes adapt, so you don't actually um, see the image move in front of you. The brain and the eyes correct, so although the individual's eyes might be moving, they're not actually seeing a moving image. So it's quite fascinating, really. Sometimes people that acquire nystagmus from another condition in later life uh, do have an image distortion, an oscillopsia, so their eyes move, uh, so their image moves when their eyes move. Okay, so this is, oh, it has worked, that's good. So this is obviously a gif of going around in circles, but if you can just see, this is horizontal nystagmus, so this is someone's eye with the condition, um, and you see it's moving side to side. Um, so it, it's quite hard, it's, I thought I'd show you, it's quite hard to actually imagine, if you had never seen it before, um, what it looks like. So yeah, and as I said, you can get all different types, side to side, up and down, um, alternating. So some people will, will go one way for a bit and then they'll go the other way. Um, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite fascinating, but also very, very complex. So in terms of kind of you know, medical sociology, we're always interested in public health, we're always interested in kind of the prevalence of these conditions, and that's what I was quite interested in, because I didn't know the prevalence of the condition before I started this. Um, so in terms of congenital nystagmus, or acquired infantile nystagmus, so essentially being sort of born with the condition, um, it's about one in 1,000 babies, which is, in terms of medical, which is quite common. You know, that's quite a, it's not a rare condition, but not a lot of people necessarily know about it. Um, a lot more people develop the condition, as I said, from, from, other, um, from other problems that they might have. So I'll go into that in a bit more detail. But I was quite interested to see that it wasn't that rare, but actually there's not a lot of research out there in terms of the, the lived experiences of people with it. Um, so this is what I was talking about before. Um, and this is another thing I found out. So in the early stages of reviewing literature, you, you learn a lot before you even conduct any research. So when I was born, um, the condition was called congenital nystagmus, because um, I have the form that is sort of from birth. But now, in the current literature, you'll see a shift. Um, they've stopped using that term, because through research, they discovered that um, it's thought now not to be hereditary or acquired um, after birth or within the first few months after birth. So people are predisposed to have the condition, but they're not born with it, as in the sense it develops a little bit after birth. Um, so that's quite interesting, whereas it was originally thought that it was you know, purely uh, congenital. So now we refer to it as infantile nystagmus syndrome, so that added another factor in my lip searches. So anyone you know that's well, most of you here will have done literature reviews and um, searching databases. I now have sort of two conditions, as well as forty-seven different types. You know, pre sort of I don't know two thousand, they were calling it a different name as well. So adds adds lots of layers. So it may present on its own, or it might um, come alongside other conditions. 
Um, well, that was the wrong button, wasn't it? <laughs> there we go. Um, <coughs> so because I don't have any of my own qualitative research yet, and as I said, I will look at some of the, the current research, I just got this from the Nystagmus Network. So this is just um, George, who was 11. I just thought this quite sort of summed up the condition quite nicely. Um, so he says, my eyes sometimes move without me wanting them to. Sometimes I find it difficult to see things. I can only see about three meters clearly. It hurts my eyes and I have to look at long distances. So because there was so little, there's so little qualitative research out there, I thought it was nice to just sort of show um, you know, the perspective of an 11 year old. And because it's a massively under, under um, it's not an understandard condition necessarily. Um, I think a lot of children with it um, you know, suffer with it because they, people don't really understand the condition because it is quite rare, um, although not that rare. Um, okay, so hopefully if I come back in four to six years I might have some of my own kind of quality to tell you about. So just to add to the confusion of the condition and then, you know, it's been a learning curve for me. I thought I knew quite a lot about the condition, but until you start researching it, it's, um, you know, you learn a lot more. So. It's a lot more complex than this, but I basically split it into the kind of two forms of the condition that you could have, um, acquired nystagmus and early onset nystagmus. Um, acquired nystagmus is, as, as the name suggests, you, you develop it later on in life. Um, and this is often through, so people who have never had it before, they'll be often through things like MS, um, head trauma. Uh, quite often people that have, have concussion will p temporarily present with nystagmus, um, which is all you know, a concern for someone, uh, maybe like a child that has nystagmus, and if someone assumes they're concussed, you know, uh, but they're not, you know, so that, um, it raises some issues. But um, also certain drug, drugs may cause it, so recreational and prescription drugs may cause nystagmus. Um, Interestingly, there's a lot of research on the biggest group sort of that probably has acquired nystagmus is actually, um, and this is more traditional now, but is it people who have worked in the mining industry, um, so like coal mining and things, because of the time spent in the dark, um, they, a lot of them actually acquired nystagmus. And one of the earliest, from my lit review, one of the earliest PhDs I can find on nystagmus from, I think, 1903. Um, was actually about minus nystagmus, and it was you know, handwritten. Um, so even early as then they were kind of looking at it. But um, so yeah, so that's quite interesting. And a lot of the studies, because there's not enough participants, they'll combine acquired and early onset nystagmus in the same sample, um, which I think you know these people have experienced very different things. So the other sort of part of the condition, uh, the other type of the condition, which is early onset, which is probably what I'm going to be focusing on more so, and that's the form of condition that, that I would, I would fall into. Um, this again splits further. Um, so there's infantile nystagmus syndrome with identifiable pathology. So we know what's caused it because, as I said, it develops usually because of other factors. Um, one of those being a lot of people with the identified pathology often have um, things like ocular albionism. So they have things like X, which is like pale retinas. Um, so you'll find that people that have the, when there's an identifiable pathology, people will often have another condition that it's, it's led to that <coughs> caused it. Um, and then there's quite a few cases where there is no, it's idiopathic, so there's no, they don't know what, what's caused it. Um, but it's still developed within those first three months. So yeah, so I thought I knew a lot about the condition. and. Um, it I kind of opened a, a, you know, went down the rabbit hole really, and it's, it's pretty vast, so. Okay, so that's kind of a bit about the condition. Hopefully that's kind of been interesting. Um, now onto my lit review. So this is the stage I'm at now. Um, and just for the sort of the students in the room, you might think, you know, what's been doing for the last 11 months. Um, you know, I'm looking at probably about 10,000 words for a, just for the lit review. So you can imagine how much time that, that takes. So you know, a PhD is a pretty big undertaking. Um, so I'm still at the lit review stage. I initially conducted like a scoping review, so a, a review where it wasn't a kind of proper lit search. It was just me looking on Google Scholar trying to find out 
the current research. And um, that then went narrowed down into sort of a research strategy. So I started thinking of like keywords that I was going to use. Um, then it led me to picking some databases to search within and then repeating those searches. Um, and obviously, because a, a PhD is so long, the lit reviews never really finished. Um, I kind of thought I'd find a lot of qualitative information research out there. And then the other day, you know, a paper was released about COVID and the assignments, and it was a qualitative piece, so I had to add that in. Um, so you know, lit reviews never really finished. Um, but what I've found so far is that it's predominantly clinical research on nystagmus. So thousands and thousands of pages of clinical research, uh, very little quant uh, qualitative research out there about the lived experiences of people with nystagmus. Yeah, particularly, and, and often it will be, they'll mention quality of life in a tiny paragraph, but the rest will be very much quantitative. Um, so one study... And a lot of qualitative, uh, qualitative studies are just in themselves reviews, so lit reviews and systematic reviews of current research. So there's very little actual qualitative research out there, which is great for me, because I'm about to spend the next six years you know, looking at it, so that's good. Shows you the benefits of a, you know, a good lit review. So Singh was a, was a particular study that I looked at from 2015, and he, re he reiterates this. So his review was called The Life with Nystagmus, and again, it was sort of a systematic review. And he, encouragingly, he picked out that we needed, um, the, the missing areas of nystagmus research were quality of life. So every time I see that, I'm kind of like, yes, I'm, I'm going in the right direction here. Um, I'm kind of highlighting it. So, so that's good. So the, they're starting to say the things that I kind of, uh, I want to hear something. Okay, this study, this is a study that, the gold standard study really, it appears to be, the gold standard sort of qualitative study um, conducted through um, Leicester University Hospital. So they are the, one of the leading nystagmus hubs, kind of research hubs. Um, and annoyingly, I, every study that I find that mentions qualitative research, I get really excited. And then I'll be like, oh, it's a new quality study, and then they'll, they'll reference from Clarence Excel 2012. So there's not many out there. They keep the, everyone referencing these. So when I was looking at Singh, he, he mentioned uh, McLaren. Pretty much every study that's vaguely qualitative will be mentioned McLaren. So what they did was they conducted semi structured interviews um, at the University of Leicester with UK participants. So they had quite a big hub of. Um, patients that they, they see regularly so they can kind of tap into them. But interestingly, they used 21, the sample was only 21, um, and but they, it was acquired and infantile nystagmus. So I can't remember the, you know, the ratios, but if that's half and half, you know, it's only really sort of 10 people with each type of the condition, and you're kind of getting into very different, um, it's very different someone that's born with the condition versus someone that, um, acquires the condition. But anyway, it's, it's one of the main qualitative studies, so I'm, I'm, I'm keeping it. Um, interestingly, what they found from this study was that it, universally negative experiences um, that hadn't been reported previously, probably because there isn't anything, to be fair. There isn't a lot out there, anyway. So, um, and helpfully, quite helpfully for me, they actually identified six domains um, that in areas of life that affected people. So these were um, areas that were adversely affected by nystagmus. So the main, these, these were visual function, restriction of movement, standing out and not fitting in, feelings about the inner self, negativity, and the future and relationships. So quite nicely, they started to sort of categorize some of the, the problems maybe faced by people with the condition. Um, and you, know, you can imagine if in social situations, if someone's eyes are moving, you know, that might, they might feel reluctant to go and speak to people. Uh, you know, culturally, eye contact is something we'd expect, isn't it? But it might be hard for someone with the snagmus to kind of hold eye contact. So, um, so this is really useful for me. Oh, do you want um, okay, so just a, another piece of current research out there. Um, Renee et al, 2022. So this was the study that I sort of thought I found everything so far, and then they released this. 
Um, again, this sort of concurs with the previous authors and the sort of general consensus of my research that there is limited literature that looks at the understanding and public or social elements of nystagmus. So every time someone seems to look at nystagmus, uh, vaguely qualitative, they point out that there's nothing looking at quality of life, nothing looking at um, social elements, psychological elements within, the, within these studies. Um, interestingly, this study looked at both public understanding of how nystagmus affects people who have the condition and the perceptions of public understanding by those with the condition and their carers. I couldn't find a way to write that in a way that wasn't confusing because the, the study was a little bit confusing, but essentially what they did was they asked both people with and without nystagmus about the perceptions of the condition and the people, their carers, essentially. So they, it's quite an interesting angle. They were looking at people's perception of the condition who didn't have the condition, which I thought was quite nice because you don't often get that. And again, this, highlight, this uh, study highlighted the lack of public awareness regarding nystagmus. And at the end, they actually suggest opportunities to increase awareness for nystagmus. Um, and one of those ways they suggest is actually sort of gaining more of an understanding from the, the people with nystagmus. So maybe getting those people to do talks, getting those people to um, you know, do case studies and things, um, which was really nice to see, because that's kind of the angle that I'm kind of going for with my research. So it was nice to see other researchers pointing to that, you know, that was something that needed to be done. Um, yeah, rather than from the clinician's point of view. Um, so, the final just study I wanted to quickly talk about um, was <coughs> Penix 2015. Again, this was another review, so it's qualitative, but like a systematic review. Um, they look at they again pointed out the need for quality of life and patient experience to be examined. They noted that the existing research has looked very little at vision specific and health in relation to quality of life for individuals. So they're all kind of pointing to lived experiences in, in different ways and quality of life um, being missing from the current literature. And in a lot of the research papers that I have found, they will lump nystagmus in with other conditions. So they might look at a sample of children um, and those children might have nystagmus and another condition or other visual um, problems and then they're kind of like lumping them in together with you know the same sort of applying the same problems to those groups when each group is very different um, and has their own set of problems so there's minimal specific research that is qualitative on the condition so again brilliant for me this is it's going well so far in terms of my lit review because it's pointing to what I, I want it's pointing to um, yeah and I think because it's such a complex condition that you need specific research on that condition. So I would, I'm going to advocate for that. Um, right, I'm getting close to the end. I'll just, I'm nearly finished. Um, so I have no idea, really, at this stage, in terms of methodology. I'm starting to think that, it obviously, it'll be qualitative. Um, I've looked at biographical research methods, which was kind of new to me. I was thinking, uh, phenomenological, like Sophie's done, uh, but biographical research seems to be quite uh, fitting for what I'm doing. And this is a type of qualitative research that uses stories and biography, biographies essentially, um, sort of linked with anthropology and things like that, to uh, build up a picture of the person's kind of life and their experiences of condition. Um, but it emphasises the importance of subject experience within historical and social context. So, and this might be, you might revisit them multiple times to build a picture, a life history. Um, so the other thing I'll be thinking about is the age range of people, because obviously you can't necessarily get a life history of someone that is only you know, 15, for example. So I'll be, I'll be kind of thinking of specific age ranges. So my hope is to eventually, it's sort of shed new light on the patient experience. That's my kind of end goal. I know we can never really know, especially in qualitative research, we kind of, we don't know the answers yet. Um, and I'm hoping to hopefully just Im improve the experience for the, the person with nystagmus and get that different viewpoint. Um, really quickly, just a person that has a sandwich you might not know. So Richard Osman from TV, uh, TV presenter and author, has a sandwich, I don't even know that. Um, he was on Who Do You Think You Are recently? And he talked about his condition. So I think as more people come forward in the media with the condition, 
um, you know, that's only going to help as well. Um, there's all my references. If anyone would like any of those or any more information, happy to chat about it. So, a bit of a kind of um, n nothing hands on uh, empirical to tell you yet, but um, I hope that's been kind of informative and, and helpful. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating to actually learn a bit more about your condition. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> thank you yeah. for sharing that. Okay, thank you. Any, any questions? Go on, Sophie, yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure I'm going to put you on the spot. But you will. Um, I will. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you, that first um, article you talked about, so, how they identified, uh, McLean, is it? McLean et al, and how they identified the six oh, domains. Oh, McLean, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, the six domains. <laughs> Sort of yeah. that were affected yeah. by the status. So when you look at your research, are you going to try and put what people are talking about into themes, or do you think you're going to use like I don't know, like a quality of life framework almost to sort of theme yeah. what what you find into those categories, or have you not thought that far ahead? I have thought about it, but I'm not I'm not sure yet. So I thought about maybe like a potentially sort of leaning towards mixed methods and maybe doing like a quality of life survey as well, and then kind of. You know, some triangulation sort of mm -hmm. thing, or potentially kind of sort of similar to what you did, maybe where um, I'm looking at particular categories. Um, so I'm not sure yet, but it's certainly certainly today has kind of given me a bit of inspiration, actually, seeing different people's uh, the way people approach the data differently. Um, so the answer is I'm not sure. No, yeah. You should stay in this room as well because we're going to have a conversation about methodology. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, that'll be very handy. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, does it affect? Someone's driving, for example, and yeah. um, also what direction uh, is your mother's So, uh, yes, it does. So, I can't drive currently. Um, a lot of driving was actually in that in that piece of research. There, driving came up as another problem. Um, mine is, is horizontal, so move side to side. Um, there is treatment out there for it as well. So, interestingly, we were talking about dementia earlier. Um, Mementine mm -hmm. that's used for dementia. Um, by accident was used on an astagmus patient who also had dementia and they realised that the eye movement was reduced. So there's a lot of people, um, and I'm actually on that, I'm actually um, on a trial with Leicester as well at the moment. So again, I'm kind of trying to separate these two areas, but um, there's a lot of people that can drive now because of the, the treatment out there. So yeah, but certainly driving is a big factor that it affects. Yeah. Do the different ways that eyes move affect different aspects of what they can and can't do, or the quality of life. I'm just, this, that's just more curiosity. Well, it seems, seems to be the dip, well, I'm not sure on that, but certainly, depending on the type of segments, different treatments don't respond as well to others. Mm -hmm. So, momentine teams seems to work better for sort of like congenital, mm -hmm. uh, well, in acquired nystagmus. Okay. Um, things like gabapentin have also been quite uh, successful. Uh, but then, other conditions, other forms of it don't respond differently. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure. The other thing that I didn't really get to talk about was. Um, People with dysphagmus will, will have a null point, so they don't focus, at, you know, where someone with a normal vision would focus forward. Um, people with dysphagmus will have a null point, which is they focus to one side or maybe up, so that they're where their eyes are the most still. It's um, off centre. So yeah, that could depend on the type. That could affect quality of life. You know, if you're doing like a ball sport yeah. and your um, is like down, for example, your, your null point they might do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you? No, 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 I don't. So generally people that have infantile nystagmus don't because the brain, because it's neurological, the brain and the eyes have sort of adapted, but it's people that tend seem to develop it in later life seem to, um, yeah. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Another talk there. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah. I guess my, I've got a question and a comment. So the question is, what is your research question? Uh, and my comment is, um, you're interested in biographical research mm. methods. Mm. Why not frame your your piece of work, mm. your PhD, around the biographical literature? So things like Mike Barry's work on biographical disruption, yeah. or Arthur Frank's work around narratives of health and illness, which might be helpful to understand some of the domains there. Yeah, so that's something I certainly would be. I'd actually be quite interested to talk to you about that actually a little later on. But um, I have started to look at some of the more anthrop anthropological and kind of biographical research. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm planning to do. Um, so what did you say before that? What's your question? Oh, basically what I want to sort of find out is, are 
does the lived experiences of people with a psychopath match up to what they're told by the medical profession, essentially? Um, so, you know, that's, that's, that's it really, what I'm trying to find out. There's a question here. Sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Have, yeah. have, have you looked at other tissue disorders and seen how people have dealt with uh, research into those? Um, I haven't, but other conditions have come up in the literature search, so quite often they'll put other conditions in with the research, but I haven't specifically, just because the research so, is so vast and the stagnant on its own, I haven't, but um, some of the theoretical stuff I'm looking at in terms of analysing the data, I've certainly looked at how they've analysed other conditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, I have in some ways. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, so interestingly I've actually looked at how some people have analysed like, dementia and things, yeah. um, because that's obviously like life-changing, so yeah. So I, I think particularly about taking it, because again, yeah. that's going to stay similar yeah. patterns. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, that's something I hadn't thought actually, but I, yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Okay, very last one. Okay. Yes, um, when you spoke about um, building public awareness, yeah, awareness. yeah. I mean, how, uh, you, 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 got, you got an idea how you know, like, way of doing that. So. Um, no, not yet. <laughs> uh, and I'd, I'd like to, I mean, potentially maybe like developing like a, like a specific quality of life survey for the condition after I've done my research, or um, I don't know, raising awareness throughout my research potentially. You know, um, I think it's in schools and things. You know, it, it could be made more aware. But um, not really at that stage yet. So, but yeah, good, good question. Thank you, Manu. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.